This video is essentially a Dell setup guide for Ubuntu 2404 long-term support and patch one has just been released. So I'm going to have a look at looking at the system's information so you can find out the model. And then I'm going to have a look at downloading the Linux BIOS update and preparing this on a USB. And then I'm going to have a look at updating the BIOS. Now there's two um, kind of sub biases Dell use uh, two manufacturers, American Megatrends and Phoenix. So they normally use these for the home and business systems. So I'll have a look at, at the two variations. Then I'm going to have a look at creating a bootable USB on both Windows and Ubuntu. And then I'm going to have a look at the Dell UFI BIOS setup and performing a data wipe on these two BIOS subversions. So then we're going to look at booting from the USB, installing Ubuntu, having a look at the software update and also having a look at firmware and the Linux vendor firmware service. So this can be used to update the BIOS and also update the Thunderbolt dock. So next I'm going to have a look at some Linux applications such as the screenshot and screencast, the only office desktop editors, an equivalent to Microsoft Paint, a media player and the browsers. So next I'm going to have a look at the display driver graphics model. So right now you should be moving towards Wayland. So Intel's got full support for Wayland. Some features such as fractional scaling are not fully supported. So they're enabled by default on Ubuntu, but they're classified by GNOME who make the desktop environment as experimental. So they, they kind of work, but you may encounter some bugs. So next I'm going to have a look at multiple monitors and docking stations. And then I'm going to have a look at a system with a NVIDIA graphics card. So there's a lot of issues with NVIDIA and NVIDIA drivers. So by default, um, Ubuntu's using the legacy display driver graphics model, which has a number of issues. If you switch to Wayland with the built-in 535 driver, you're going to have a lot of issues. However, these can be resolved by upgrading to the 555 driver. Next, I'm going to have a look at touchscreen, so the touchscreen keyboard and device auto rotation. And then I'm going to have a look at Chromium. Now, unfortunately, Chromium doesn't support the touchscreen keyboard. However, this is being worked on, so I'm going to also have a look at the Canary build. Next, I'm going to have a look at GNOME tweaks and GNOME extensions. And I'm going to have a look at some of the particularly useful extensions I found, such as Tiling Shell, Emoji Copy, Clipboard History, Show Desktop Button, Removable Drive Menu, and Screen Rotator. Finally, I'm going to finish up having a look at the, the webcam. So many Dell systems have a new version of webcam called a, a MIPI um, camera. And there's an Intel Processing Unit 6 driver, um, which is experimental. So it's being developed by Linux kernel developers, but it isn't included in the current kernel because it's not stable. So you can essentially install an experimental kernel and the camera may or may not work in your case. So let's open up Windows and type in msinfo32. I noticed this is a Dell XPS 8960 and it's got BIOS version 2.6.0. So what I'm going to do is now press Control Shift and Escape and open up the task manager and we can have a look at the tabs just to see details about the system hardware such as the processor, the RAM, um, the graphics card and the wireless card. So next I'm going to go to Dell drivers and downloads and this is a uh, Dell XPS 8960. So I can select browse all products, computers. This is a desktop and it's an XPS and it's a tower and it's an 8960. So I can select this product. 
So if I select expand here and select bias, I can get to the bias update and I can go ahead and download the Linux version. I'm actually going to download the second Linux version so I can test a Linux vendor firmware service. However, in your case, you're going to want the Linux version as it may resolve boot issues. And it's generally recommended to have the latest BIOS update before going ahead and installing a new operating system. So next, I'm going to download Rufus and I essentially just want to use Rufus to format the USB correctly. So I'm going to insert a 16 gigabyte USB flash drive and then I'm going to go ahead and launch Rufus. So this USB flash drive has had Fedora on it. So what I'm going to do is just create a non-bootable USB. So I'm going to select the USB flash drive, select non-bootable, select the partition scheme as GPT, change the label to USB, and then change the file system to NTFS. Using FAT32 will work, um, but there'll be an upper limit for the file size. So you'll, you'll not be able to copy file sizes greater than four um, gigabytes on the USB flash drive if you, you have FAT32. So now going over to Ubuntu, I'm going to open all applications and then go to settings and then select system and then have a look at the system. And in this case, I see it's a latitude 9,420. So I'm just going to go to Dell Drivers and Downloads and search for latitude 9,420. And once again, I'm going to select BIOS. And then I'm going to download the latest version. Now in this case, it's giving me the information about the BIOS update, which is this text file. So I need to select other formats and get the application. Now on Ubuntu, we're going to use an application called Gparted. So this is a partition editor and we can use this to prepare the USB flash drive. So let's go ahead and launch Gparted and we're going to need to input our password to authenticate this because it needs root access to actually go ahead and format the USB flash drive. So we want to select the USB flash drive and then we want to right click any partition and select unmount. Now you might have multiple partitions, so you're going to need to do, do this for each partition. Then you want to select device, create partition table, and then select GPT. We want to change the file system to NTFS. And we can have the partition name and label as USB. Select apply to apply the changes, and then select apply again, and then close. So now the USB flash drive is ready, and what we essentially want to do is just copy the BIOS update to it. So now that we've got the BIOS update on the USB, we can go ahead and update the BIOS. So the first system I'm going to have a look at is the, um, essentially the home system with the American Megatrends BIOS. So power up the system and press F12 and then select BIOS flash update utility. The correct file system should be selected. So in this case, it's file system zero. And you can essentially see the, the BIOS update listed under files. So select this file and then select flash, flash upgrade. And then select yes. And now it's going to restart and your computer should essentially update um, its bias. And then after the bias is updated, you're going to see it boot into the currently installed operating system as normal. So on this system, Windows 11 is installed. So I can go ahead and log in. And if I have a look at the system information again, I can see that the BIOS has been updated.
Okay, let's now have a look at the, the upper system, which has the Phoenix bias. So this is for the business system. So we're going to power it up and press F12. And this gives the, the following boot menu and we can select bias update. We need to select flash from file. And then we need to select the USB and then we need to navigate the file system to get to the bias update. Select the file and then select confirm bias update. And the system will reboot and the bias will go ahead and update. So after it's updated, you'll boot into the currently installed operating system, which in this case is Ubuntu 2404. And if we open up system, select settings and system details, we can see that the BIOS has now been updated. Let's now go ahead and create a bootable USB on Windows. So if we just select download Ubuntu desktop, what we can do is select desktop and then select download Ubuntu desktop and then select download. So this is a large file and it's going to take a while to download. So just for convenience, I'm going to speed up the video recording. And now I've got the ISO downloaded. So we've already downloaded Rufus and we're going to use Rufus to create a bootable USB. So if we go ahead and launch Rufus and accept user account control prompt, what we want to do is select and then select ISO and then we want to compute the ISO checksums. So we've got this SHA256 and what we want to do is just verify this. So if we just go to releases.ubuntu.com and then just scroll down, we've got this SH256 sums. And if we just press Ctrl and F and paste in the value that we found in Rufus, we should see a match. So we know that ISO has been correctly downloaded. Next, we're going to select our USB flash drive and then we're going to select GPT and select FAT32 and then write in ISO mode and then select OK. So Rufus is going to format the USB flash drive and then it's going to essentially copy all the files from the installation ISO across creating the bootable USB. So once this is done, Rufus will say ready and you can go ahead and close Rufus. So now we can just exit out of Windows. And let's have a look at creating a bootable USB in, in Ubuntu. So what you want to have a look for is the startup disk creator in the application center. And you want to go ahead and install it. If you're using another Linux distro such as Fedora, you could use the Fedora Media Writer instead. Next, we're going to go to the Ubuntu website and download the installation ISO again. So once again, this is a, a large installation ISO and it's going to take a while to download. I've sped up the video recording um, for, for convenience. So now that we've got the installation ISO, what we want to do is go to Downloads, right click it and select Open in Terminal. And we want to type in SHA256 sum and if we just drag and drop the ISO across, it's going to give its fill file path. So here we've got the, the SHA256. And we can right click it and select copy. And we can press Control Shift and C to copy. So if we go back to releases.ubuntu.com and then select the version, and then SHA256 sums. And if we press Ctrl and F 
and paste in the checksum, we should see that it matches. So we've got a complete download, and now if we launch the um, Startup Disk Raider, the ISO should automatically be selected, and the USB flash drive should automatically be selected. So it's just a case of selecting Start and waiting for it to create the bootable USB. So once it's done, we can select Quit, and then we can just um, shut down Ubuntu. So next, I'm going to power up the Dell and press F2 to get to the Dell UFI BIOS. And this is the American Megatrends BIOS, which is typically used for home systems. So on the main tab, you're going to get system information. On the advanced tab, you're going to have essentially most of the options that you can change. The most important option is the SATA slash NVMe operation mode. And we need to change this to AHCI slash NVMe, which means each drive essentially acts independently. RAID ON essentially creates um, Intel virtual management device and you need a special driver for this and there's not one available for Linux. So you're not going to be able to recognize the drives and install the operating system. And the maintenance tab is the option to enable the Dell data wipe on the next boot. So if you select this to enabled, um, data wipe should display. Now you might actually need to restart the computer and go back into the BIOS for this to display. In my case, it just displayed without rebooting. So you can select this option and then your drives will display and you can select start this device data wipe. And in this case, I'm just going to select yes. And it's going to go ahead and securely wipe my internal NVMe solid state drive. So the speed of the data wipe for a NVMe solid state drive should be relatively fast. It should be done within about three minutes. Um, if you're using a hard drive, um, because the data wipe is sequential and the drive speed is slow, it may take several hours. So the clear is now complete. And I'm going to select exit. And then I'm going to select data wipe on next boot and select disabled. And the security tab, we've got the options to change secure boot. And it should be set to in enabled with deployed mode, which is essentially the default settings. In the boot tab, we see the boot options and we can select to delete a boot option. So we can delete the old Windows boot manager here. And then we can go to exit and we can select change, save changes and exit. For the Phoenix bias, we access it in the same way. So power up the system and press F2. And you're going to be taken to the overview, which is going to give you details about, about your system. So here we can see that it's got an Intel video controller and an Intel wireless card and a Realtek audio controller. And we can see its processor and RAM. To the left, we want to make sure the advanced menu is on. If we go to boot sequence, we can delete old boot entries. So I can delete the old Ubuntu and Fedora here. And essentially all I want to leave behind is the UFI bootable USB, which has Ubuntu on it. If we go down, we should see that secure boot is enabled. And it should be in deployed mode using the default settings. Under integrated devices, you should essentially be using the default settings. And there's no um, custom settings for the, the camera and camera shutter on this system. If we go into storage, we can change the SATA slash NVMe 
operation and recall that we need to use AHCI NVMe so each drive is independently listed and not grouped together using an Intel volume management device. Um, this requires an Intel VMD driver which isn't available for Linux. So most of the other options should be left at their default. So the TPM 2.0 should be enabled by default under security. The update and recovery and system management options um, can be left under defaults. Now because this is a laptop there are some options about um, the keyboard and the function key. These can be uh, amended as desired, however I'm just going to leave the default option. In preboot behavior, there is an option called fastboot, and this should be set to auto by default. In the past, some biases had some issues when auto was enabled, so essentially wireless cards wouldn't, wouldn't be enabled within Linux, they were kind of left in a sleeping state. So changing the option to furrow um, resolved this issue. If you're using a system with an up-to-date BIOS, this issue should be resolved. So try it with um, auto, and if you have a problem, then change it to furrow. If we go to the security tab, we've got the option to enable the Dell Data Wipe. So if we select OK, and then OK again, and then select No to not cancel the operation. We can now apply the changes and then select OK and then select Exit. So now when the system reboots, we'll see the Dell Data Wipe prompt. So select Continue and then select Erase. So once again, uh, NVMe solid state drive will be securely wiped um, within a few minutes and a mechanical hard drive which has a slower access time and performs a sequential data wipe will take several hours. To access the BIOS boot menu, power up the system and press F12 and then select your USB flash drive. So once again, the, Boot screen looks slightly different for, for both variations of the BIOS. Select Try or Install Ubuntu. And you should see the, the spinner rotate as Ubuntu loads. So select your language and then select next. Select next and then select your keyboard layout and optionally test it. In the next screen select connect to a Wi-Fi network and select your Wi-Fi network and input your password and select connect. Select next and then select Install Ubuntu. Select Interactive Installation. In the next screen, you've got the option for a default selection or an extended selection. The main difference between the default and the extended selection is the inclusion of LibreOffice. So if you want to pre-install that Office suite, select the extended selection. I prefer to use only Office Desktop Editor, so I'm just going to use the default selection. In the next screen, you're going to want to install the third-party software for graphics and Wi-Fi hardware. And you're also going to want to select, download and install support for additional media formats. So the Linux kernel contains a collection of open source drivers developed directly by the Linux kernel developers in collaboration with the device manufacturer. So this is normally the chip manufacturer, such as Intel. Unfortunately, some chip manufacturers, such as NVIDIA, um, only provide closed source drivers, and these aren't included in the Linux kernel, so this is why this option needs to be selected separately. 
The other option, uh, the multimedia codecs, are also under different licensing restrictions. So they're not slipstreamed into the Linux kernel. And this is why you need to select the, the option to install these individually. In order to get full system functionality, you're going to, in most cases, want to check both boxes. In the next screen, select Arrays Disk and install Ubuntu. So in the next screen, you're going to set up your user account. So your full name can be um, how you would normally write your name with um, capitalization and spaces. Your PC name and your username should be in lowercase without any spaces. Because your username in particular will be essentially the name of the folder of your user profile. And the convention is to use a lowercase folder name without any special characters, except for the dash. Next, input your password and then confirm your password. Select your location on the map to get the correct time zone and then select install. So now all the necessary files will be copied from the installation media. And when it's done, you're going to be prompted to restart your computer. you're going to be prompted to remove your bootable USB and then press enter. So next, log in to your user account and you'll be presented with the last um, pages of the setup. Select next. And in the next screen, you can optionally enable Ubuntu Pro. I'm going to skip this for now. In the next screen, you're going to be asked whether you want to help improve Ubuntu by sending your system details. I'm just going to share my system data with the Ubuntu team and then select next. And in the last screen, you're going to be told about the application center. Select finish to complete the installation. So if we select all applications, we can go to settings. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we can select system and we can select about. So in the about page, you should see system details. And to the bottom, you're going to have the Linux kernel version and you're going to have the windowing system, which is essentially the display uh, graphics driver model. In this case, I'm using a uh, Intel system with um, Intel integrated graphics and it's using the Wayland um, windowing system which is more modern. If all applications are selected we can go to the software updater to update the operating system. Because the installation ISO is just released the system is up to date. Ubuntu has this firmware updater and on my system this firmware updater seems to just be read only. So I thought it was supposed to be a graphical version of the Linux vendor firmware service. So I can have a look at using this now to update the firmware of this Latitude 9420 and the Dell dock that it's attached to, the WD19TB. So if I type in firmware update manager get devices, then I'll get details about all the devices and the firmware versions. If I type in firmware update manager, get updates, I'm going to be told about the, the updates that are available. So in this case, there is an update for the Dell UFI BIOS itself, and also an update for the WD19 Thunderbolt dock. So in order to install the updates, I'm going to type in the firmware update manager and then update. And because I need to run this command with elevated privileges, I'm going to prefix it with sudo, which is super user do. So I'm going to be required to input my password in order to authenticate this action and proceed. Uh, I'm going to need to select Y at, on the prompts to proceed with the firmware update and it's going to go ahead and update the firmware for the WD19 Thunderbolt dock. 
to update the Dell UFI BIOS, you're going to be prompted for a restart. The system is going to restart and apply the BIOS update. Once the BIOS has been updated, the system is going to restart and you're going to be taken back into the login screen. And now if the terminal is reopened and the last command is, is input just by pressing the up arrow. So this is sudo firmware update manager update. Uh, it now reports that all the devices are up to date. Pressing the print screen button will open the GNOME screenshot and screencast. And here you can select a selection or you can select a window or you can capture the screen. And if you go to pictures and screenshots, you can see the three screenshots here. To make a screencast, select the video icon and optionally select show pointer and then select record. To the top right, you're going to see the, the timer. So I'm going to install the only office desktop editors from the application center. And now that this is installed, I can go ahead and launch it. So only Office Desktop Editors essentially has documents, spreadsheet and presentation, which are very similar to Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel and Microsoft PowerPoint. So these are offline Office suites and they have most of the functionality that's commonly used in, in the Microsoft Office suite. So I can now end my screencast and it's going to be saved in the videos folder uh, under the subfolder screencast. And notice that you can see the mouse pointer in the screen recording. So if you're a Windows user or you've been a Windows user and you're coming over to Linux, you might um, be looking for an alternative application to Microsoft Paint and there isn't one pre-installed. The closest one I could find is Drawing. Um, there is also Color Paint. Both of these are a bit behind Microsoft Paint. So if we go ahead and install Drawing, we can use it to, for example, crop this screenshot. And then we can carry out some basic operations such as annotations and text. And another option you've got available to you is JavaScript Paint. So JavaScript Paint is essentially a rewrite of Microsoft Paint using JavaScript. And it's unfortunately the paint coming from Windows XP which has a few missing features. So if we just search for JavaScript paint and open it up, notice that we've essentially got this classic paint that's available in Windows XP. And we can use the menu to open up an image and manipulate it and then save it. If we select view and zoom, notice that we are restricted to the zoom range so we can't go smaller than 100% and this was one of the limits of paint on Windows XP that got addressed in Windows 7. So hopefully that gets added soon. We can also change the theme of this to make it look slightly more modern, uh, more similar to the paint on Windows 7. So the pre-installed browser on Ubuntu is Firefox. Um, it's quite common to install Chromium. So Chromium is the open source version of Google Chrome. So Google Chrome is based upon Chromium. So Google will take Chromium and then they add th their own stuff on top of Chromium. Microsoft also take Chromium and add their own stuff on it to make Edge. So we can go ahead and install Chromium. And if you want Chrome itself, it's not an application store you need to actually search for Get Chrome and download the Debian package. 
So Ubuntu is a Debian-based distribution and it can install Debian packages and Snap packages. The application store will list Snap packages preferentially over Debian packages. So for Google Chrome, they've not created a Snap package and therefore we need to download it separately using the Debian package. So the Wayland display driver model is enabled by default. So if I go to start and settings and the system is using one of the external monitors um, to perform the screen recording and it's also got the laptop screen. So I can join these displays. I notice that I've got a high resolution laptop screen and it's using 175% fractional scaling and the external monitor is using 100% scale. So the Wayland display driver model supports different screens with different screen resolutions and different scaling factors. So if I just use the GNOME screenshot, I can actually just um, create a selection and stretch it across the two screens. Okay, so now I'm going to have a look at looking at both of these monitors together. And if I just open up my screen recording, you can see both these screens. So in Ubuntu, Canonical have enabled an experimental GNOME feature, and this is the fractional scaling. So it works most of the time as expected. However, it's not entirely stable when using different screens and one screen being touchscreen and the other screen not being touchscreen and using different um, screen resolutions. So if I go to the accessibility tab, I can select always show the accessibility menu. And what I'm trying to do is use my touchscreen on the right with essentially the mirror display and perform the screen recording on the left. So with this configuration, I've noticed that the touch interface is a bit unstable. So it's not working as expected. And actually, if I go to the accessibility icon and if I use the keyboard and the mouse and I go to this icon and try and turn off some of the settings that have been turned on, um, the, the settings don't actually toggle off. If I disable the fractional scaling, notice that I'm only using a small fraction of my screen now. And in order to, to use my full screen, I need to restart. Okay, so now I'm back to my normal screen and I'm using the external monitor. So I undocked the laptop and had a look at the touchscreen user interface and used a screen recording. So I'm just going to install VLC player to view the screen recording. And now the screen recording displays. So if I go to the accessibility menu, I'm going to enable large text and the screen keyboard. And if I go to displays, I'm using 175% fractional scaling. Notice if I drag Firefox up to the top, I can maximize it. And notice if I press into the address bar or into the search bar, the touchscreen keyboard populates. Now the user interface isn't flawless and sometimes you need to press into it multiple times for it to do display. Now, if we open up Chromium, the touchscreen keyboard does not populate because the text input protocol 3 is not supported 
and many apps on Linux are based upon Chromium, so we'll also have the same fault. So if we download the Canary build of Chromium, um, this setting is an experimental feature. So we can go into flags and enable it. And now known as that the touchscreen keyboard now populates when you're pressing into a touch input field. But there's some things that don't work, such as the, the backspace, which currently does nothing. This is a work in progress, and it's likely that Chromium will be updated soon to, to support this. If I open up the system menu to the top right, and I take this latitude 9420 and fold it to make it tablet, notice that the auto rotate button displays. So now when I turn this laptop around, the screen's going to automatically rotate. So the screen casting still continues recording when the device is rotated. However, because a selection was made, it's still using the same selection area. So when I unfold this from tablet mode and make it a laptop, then the screen should be upright and the auto rotation will be turned off. So I've noticed a bit of a bug. If you do this too fast, then you actually end up with the laptop with the screen sideways or upside down and the rotation lock off. So you need to unfold it again and then change the orientation and then um, fold it back into a laptop. So the touchscreen user interface isn't as seamless as it is on other operating systems, such as Windows, and hopefully some of these small bugs that have been highlighted will be addressed soon, um, giving a smoother user interface. So if I now go to my XPS 8960 desktop, this is equipped with a NVIDIA card, and notice that it's using the X11 display driver by default. So if we go to settings, to system, and then about, and system details, we see that we're using X11. So X11 is a bit behind and doesn't support, for example, two different screens using two different screen resolutions and different um, display scaling. If we go into additional drivers, we can see we've got the NVIDIA 535 driver installed. Now, if we go to the logon screen and select the settings to the bottom right, we can change this to Ubuntu on Wayland. As mentioned, the 535 driver is pre-installed and notice that there's a lot of problems with this driver. If we open up settings, um, we can see that it doesn't open, it crashes. If we attempt to do the same with files, it doesn't open and it crashes. So this 535 driver isn't any good. And what we need to do is either continue using X11 or what we can do is update the NVIDIA driver to a later version that's essentially been developed by NVIDIA, but it's not been tested fully by Canonical, so it's not um, pre-installed with, with Ubuntu. So notice if we go into X11 and attempt to carry out a screen recording, and we attempt to record the mouse pointer, that we actually get screen recording without the mouse pointer moving. So there's, this is just because we're using X11 and it's got a lot of bugs in it. Okay, so if we select show all applications and then additional drivers, what we want to do is select the, the developer options tab and we want to enable pre-released updates. So here we still don't see the later NVIDIA driver. So it's only showing the driver that's supported by Canonical, which is the 535 driver. If we go to NVIDIA drivers and downloads, we can manually search for our, our product. So this is a GeForce 
RTX 40 series and it's a 4070 Ti and let me just select English UK and Linux 64 bit. So we see that the driver that NVIDIA have released is this 550 driver. So in theory, it's possible to download the driver from NVIDIA and install it using their run file. However, this isn't recommended because um, it will be blocked by a secure boot. So what we want to do is follow the Ubuntu driver guide to install the NVIDIA driver. So the first thing we want to do is copy this command to purge the old driver. So because the command's prefixed with sudo, we need to input our password in order to authenticate this action. So now that we've removed the driver, So now we want to use auto remove to remove packages that were automatically installed to satisfy dependencies for other packages that are now no longer needed. And now we want to type in sudo re reboot to reboot the computer. So in the next command, we're going to add a repository. This is essentially a location to search for packages. So we can install additional packages from this repository. And in this case, we're going to install the NVIDIA driver from this repository. So once we've added the repository, we just need to update the advanced package tool. So this will essentially check for updates in each of the repositories that's that's available. And now what we want to do is just check what the, the driver they recommend installing is. And in this case, it's the 555 driver. And um, installation is, is going to pause here because it's going to give you a note about secure boot. So essentially a dialog box displays with a message and in order to close this dialog box you need to select escape. Once you select escape it's going to ask you to input a machine owner key. So a machine owner key is essentially a password and you supply this password to the UFI bias and if it recognizes the password and the driver associated with that password then it will allow the driver to, to boot past secure boot. So now what we're going to do is type in sudo reboot and the system will reboot and take you to machine owner key management. So select Enroll machine owner key, select continue, and then select yes. Then input your machine owner key. Notice you won't dis see any characters displayed here. Press enter and then select reboot and then press enter. Now the NVIDIA driver is going to be installed. So if we log in and just open up the terminal, We can use their final command in this tutorial to check um, the, to see if the driver has been installed correctly. And we can see that the driver is installed correctly. If we go to additional drivers, we can now see that we've got additional drivers available. And this is because we've added the additional repository and we're using this 555 driver. So now if we log out and go back to login, 
we can change the display driver model to Wayland. And now that we've got this newer driver, we can open up files without it crashing. And we can open up settings without it crashing, although it crashed there. If I try again, it now opens up correctly. So it's not fully stable yet, but it's better than it was. And we can see that the display driver model is now Wayland. And we can try a screen recording with the mouse. And if we open this up, we can now see that the mouse moves in the screen recording and works as expected. So it's possible that Canonical will add the 555 driver to uh, Ubuntu 2404. Um, and this will prevent you from needing to carry out this manual installation. In Ubuntu 24.10, they're going to be working more with NVIDIA graphics cards to get them fully supported for Wayland out of the box. So going back to the Latitude 9420, one problem is that the driver for the Intel webcam, the MIPI webcam, is essentially experimental and isn't included in the Linux kernel. Now, in enabling the, the driver shown by Ubuntu doesn't work. And notice that there is this Dell article um, that essentially tells you that the webcams not going to work out of the box on Ubuntu 2404. So work's being done on making drivers that, that work for these webcams. The current solution is not production ready and is essentially experimental. So it's not recommended to carry out the following operation on a production machine or a, a mission critical machine. I'm going to try it on my system. So what I, I need to do is go to developer options and select pre-released updates. And then what I need to do is install this experimental kernel. From the OEM solutions group. So this is the development team working on these webcam drivers. So then I need to add their repository. And then I need to install some packages from their repository. And now if I go to all applications and additional drivers, I should see a new driver for the, the webcam. So I'm going to select this, this new driver. And now I'm going to need to install some applications that use the webcam. So there is the application camera. And when I attempted to use this, I got no cameras available. So another commonly used application is Cheese. So when I attempt to use this, it's once again says no devices found. So let me just go ahead and reboot. And now if I log back in and attempt to use camera or cheese, I'm essentially greeted with a black screen. However, I don't get any warning that there's no web camera available. And actually the web camera is listed. Um, it just seems that I can't use it. So as mentioned, this is experimental and possibly unstable. And in my case, it isn't working. 
So I'll leave a comment on the GitHub page and maybe see if I get some solution in order for it to work. The development team working on the drivers are going to release them to possibly the next version of the Linux kernel. So the next version of the Linux kernel and the rolling release of Ubuntu, probably Ubuntu 24.10, will have a Linux kernel with some webcam drivers. So they should work out of the box. So Canonical use a customized GNOME desktop and if we go to applications and have a look for GNOME tweaks, we can change some of the tweaks that they've applied. So this is essentially the fonts being used and also the minimize and maximize button are, are added by Canonical. So tweaks can be used to modify these settings and most users will just leave them as Canonical's modifications. We can also install the GNOME extension manager to manage the installed extensions and also install some additional third-party extensions. So Canonical have pre-installed these four extensions and the settings of the Ubuntu dock can be changed. So we can change its position to the bottom if we want. And we can change it from a panel to a dock. We can move the, essentially the all applications button to the start. And we can also isolate workspaces and monitors. So the Ubuntu dock is based on this dash to dock ex extension. So it's essentially a copy of this extension with some of Canonical's defaults um, pre-applied. So here we can see the, the changes on both screens. So we can opt to display the dock on both monitors and we can also isolate the monitors. So you'll see um, the icons open on the left will no longer show on the dock on the right because the monitors have been isolated. So we've also got, if we go to settings and appearance, we can change the color of the GNOME shell. So notice that these buttons are all in blue now. And we can also customize the, the dock color. So I can also change this to blue if I want. And the desktop icons extension can also be modified. So we can change some options such as um, this home folder where we want to display on the desktop, if we want to see the trash icon on the desktop and so on. So these four extensions are well supported because they're pre-installed by Canonical. However, we can install additional third-party extensions. Note that installation of third-party extensions can make the system unstable. So this is particularly true if the extension, for example, only has one um, application uh, developer and um, they might not address um, some instability issues. So I've installed this extension tiling and it gives me the options to tile some windows. So you can use it to create custom layouts and if you drag the window up to the top, um, you can drag it to a position in the layout. And if you hold down control by dragging the window, you can snap it into a position as well. So I'm not going to create a custom layout at this time, but you can have a look at the project's GitHub page for, for more details on how to use this extension.
So the next extension I'm going to install is the Clipboard History extension. So this essentially allows you to copy and paste multiple um, things fairly easily. So this isn't the right extension, it's only got a small number of downloads. This extension has a lot more downloads. So I've copied and pasted multiple items and they are displaying in, in the clipboard. So let me just copy this, copy this and copy this. And now we can see that these are all shown in the, the clipboard. So another extension is emoji copy. And this just makes it easier to insert an emoji. So it's not quite as powerful as the Windows emoji panel because the Windows emoji panel had mathematical symbols, um, which I tended to use more opposed to, to emojis. Hopefully this gets added to this um, emoji copy at some time in the future, or there's um, essentially a, a symbols panel in addition to the emoji panel. We can also add a show desktop button and we can add a removable drive menu. If we want to have the screen rotate button all the time, we can install the screen rotate extension. Now I'm actually on the desktop at this, this moment in time, so this button's not going to do anything. So let me just go ahead and uninstall this extension because it's useless on this desktop. So I can just use this extension manager to uninstall any unwanted extensions. 